Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Aceves, and I'm here with um, my friend Neil Bevins, and we are starting a new podcast called MindFit. This is actually our first podcast ever. Um, this is my first podcast in English. I've actually done many podcasts in Spanish before, but this is my first one in English, and I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to my friend Neil. How are you doing, Neil? Doing very well. Thank you for having me. It's also my first podcast in English. Or any other language, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, um, we decided to start this podcast because we both are, you know, huge fans of having a good mind, a clear mind, and and be healthy, um, mindfully. And you know, uh, I, I figured we talked about ourselves a little bit more in this first podcast, so that we can, you know, you you folks can get to know us and know where we're coming from. So you'll know a little bit more of uh, why we talk about the things we talk about. So, mm -hmm. Neil, tell us about, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist or a licensed psychotherapist in the state of California. And I became licensed only recently. I took my exam in February and then um, got my license in March. And uh, I do a lot of online work as well, a lot of face-to-face -face work. I work with individuals, with couples, with families, with groups, uh, with children, adolescents, And um, one of my specialties, I suppose, is anxiety, depression, self-esteem issues, um, you know, self-identity issues. And I work a lot with uh, the concept of uh, mindfulness, but not necessarily in a pure form, just in a form of um, being mindful, being in the here and now, being present, and um, what we call uh, self-leadership, leading from the sense of self. So um, that also plays into, you know, our concept of mind fit. And um, I'm also working on a self-help book at the moment, and um, that should be out, I don't know when. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you a date. Okay. Um, I don't know. And um, so I, I do see, um, like I said, I have an individual private practice as well as an online practice, and I work on an online platform. And I also lead groups a couple of time, times a week out here in Fountain Valley, uh, not far from here. So um, yeah, that's, uh, I'm also have a, I don't know if this matters, but I have a bit of an acting background. I trained as an actor long before I became a, uh, went back to school, back to graduate school. So I also have that platform in terms of, um, you know, knowing the mind from having to be personify another person or another part of you it has to draw upon other characterizations and traits. Um, that's very often how I think the mind actually works is that we have different characterizations and traits within our own mind in one mind that we call our, our, our self. So, um, you know, I use that a lot in my, uh, in my practice and in my personal life as well. Cool. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've also done a lot of acting, um, most of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I still, in fact, today take acting lessons. Um, oh, wow. and I, you know, I've been, as you know, I've been meditating, uh, most of my life since mm -hmm. I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I practice Zen meditation and I actually have, a, a practice where I teach people like a studio here in Santa Ana, which is kind of where we are recording this podcast. And um, I love people. I, I, I feel like, you know, uh, acting gives you the tools to, to improve people's lives and to improve your own life, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you felt that when you were doing acting back in the day. I did because it allowed me to venture outside of my current existence and then have to come back at the end of the day or at the end of the take, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gave me some insight into imagining myself and my emotions and my presence as another person in another situation. And a lot of times I'll be working with clients and I'll say the very, very same thing. I'll say, hypothetically, just imagine that this is what's going on as opposed to this. How would you feel differently? Uh, what if you looked at it from this perspective differently than that perspective? Because if we're playing a character, our character very well might see the world very differently than we would. And we don't have to agree with our character's point of view, but we have to play it somehow. So in shifting our own mindset or mind fitness, you know, we ask the same question. What if you looked at it the way your best friend looks at it or your mother would look at it or someone else would look at it and see how that changes your thoughts and how that changes your feelings and how that changes your entire um, perception and the way, the way you go about life? Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. I like that. So tell me some, when you were doing the acting, mm -hmm. um, I know, um, when I was doing it, that there were moments when I had some breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. Is there, was there a moment in your life when you felt like something clicked and you understood something and, and something changed your life when you were doing that? Um, when I was doing acting, um, a lot of the exhilaration uh, made me realize that uh, there was something more than just my current existence, and that was very helpful to me. It was almost like a, like a, like a drug. Um, but 
what cli- what you know sort of clicked for me was actually not during the acting phases, but later on in life. Um, one of the things that I uh, come from in my background is I used to be um, I used to be uh, quite uh, substantially overweight. I used to be close to 300 pounds and now I'm like a, a lean 175 or 178 or, you know, wow, and yeah, cool. yeah. And that's what clicked for me is because all of my life, like most people, I had been battling up and down with that mm-hmm. and um, trying different diets, different exercises, different gurus, different programs, different approaches. And um, what clicked for me um, along those lines, and that had to do with everything I'd been through in terms of training and experience and acting and all that, was that I realized I couldn't just change what I'm doing. I have to change not only how I'm thinking, but I had to change what was um, fundamental about me at the base. In other words, I had to heal something. I couldn't just say, I'm going to do this differently from now on, and I'm going to stay disciplined. Discipline is one of my least favorite words, Mm -hmm. even though it's something um, people throw around like a Frisbee. Discipline just means there's a part of you that is shaming another part of you. Is what, I, is what I noticed. It's saying, don't do that, do it this way. No, I know you want to do that, but I want you to sit down and do it this way. That's great, and that works for a little while, but I noticed in my own journey that eventually that burns out and it depletes because what you're doing is you're constantly telling yourself you're doing something wrong. If you want you know, to do something and you go ahead and do it, you shame yourself for doing it. If you don't do it, you shame yourself for having wanted to do it. So eventually you're just kicking yourself in the same place where the wounds originally started, if that makes any sense. And um, I first noticed that this is what was going on with me, is that, and what's going on, I think, with a lot of people, is I couldn't keep going around in circles like that. I had to go to the base and find out what was wounded down there and what parts of me were still crying out for needing nurture. And once I started to look at that, I was able to um, put in perspective what was happening um, and how I can stop that emotional energy from sort of taking charge of me. And in my case, using food as a way of getting away from that emotional charge. It's not about getting away from it. It's not about disciplining it. It's about finding out where it comes from and healing it at the source. And to me, that's what, you know, being mind fit would really be all about is finding out what makes you do the things you do, not just stopping yourself from doing the things you don't want to do, if that makes any sense. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, uh, when, when, you, when we talk about healing um, the wounds, like how does that work? How how do you get to that point? And at what point did you feel that your wounds were healed? Well, my wounds are not entirely healed yet. Mm-hmm. So um, you're you're always a work in progress. But what mm-hmm. you do is you bring what I, what um, you know we call sort of call the emotional charge of your wounds down from a certain um, baseline where it starts at to a different baseline. So. Um, it will go for, say, out of 100, it'll go from like a 95 when you first start the work to about a 20 or 25 when you finish. And you don't want it to go to zero because you don't want to not feel. You don't want to not know what wounds feel like. You don't want to not have emotions. You just don't want them to hijack you. You don't want them to lead the show. You don't want to be led by your feelings and by the overflow of feelings. Um, so to answer your question, I began to, um, heal when I started to look at, um, what I was running away from by using, in my case, food to run away from it. So, um, there are different aspects of self that, you know, is sort of encompass or house these wounds. And, um, there are many of them. And, um, I began to realize that whenever I had a craving to go off of a structure, or wanting to do something, I wouldn't ask myself, how come you want to go off the structure? I'd ask myself, what are you feeling right now? Where is it in your body? Uh, Where is the sensation in your body? Is it a burning? Is it a tingling? Is it a tightening? Is it a, uh, does it feel like a river? Does it feel like a knife? Does it feel like a, a pain? And then I would, I would sort of look inward and see where that was coming from. And um, usually it's coming from a younger part of you part of you that's been wounded a long time ago and is feeling something, is carrying something that you haven't looked at for a very long time. You haven't, um, you haven't allowed yourself to look at for a very long time because even if you felt that feeling, you've done everything you can to avoid it and distract from it. So, um, for example, going on diets is a way of distracting yourself from the feeling. Uh, it sounds ironic, and most people think that obviously you have to go on some sort of a diet to lose weight and we're using you know, food as an example. Well, yes, you do, but 
going on diets and focusing on the diets is a way of avoiding and distracting from what you're actually feeling, which is causing you to want the abundance of food or the wrong kinds of foods or um, to do whatever it is you were doing to yourself. And this is true of anything that, you know, uh, drugs, alcohol, gambling, sexual compulsion, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, the truth is there's very little difference between all those afflictions. Um, at least from, from my perspective, if you, if you listen to the wounds underneath and you start to spend some time with them, um, then you'll get to the root of whatever your affliction might be, including depression, including anxiety, including self-harm, including anything else that people do. So, um, I would start to feel the sensation. I'd start to feel the feelings and I'd start to go back in time and say, how old am I in this feeling? Where am I? What am I wearing? Who's around me? Uh, What's going on in this moment in time? Who just said what to me? And what did I take in? How did I internalize that? Um, If I could possibly remember. And you know it's hard to remember at first because you haven't been there in a long time. You know, it's hard to really remember and recall that feeling, recall that experience. And as I would start to recall it, I'd start to let myself feel it. Not get flooded by it, but just let myself feel it. And let myself remember myself at that age and what it was like to be me at five, six, seven, eight, ten years old, whatever it would be. And then, you know, I'm an adult now. So I can go back in time and I kind of say, you know, ironically, there is such thing as a time machine. We have one already. It's in our minds. We can go back in time anytime we want to ourselves and um, at a younger point in time and be right there as a big brother or big sister or be whatever you are and, um, and, and be with ourselves at that age. And I often say in my work, what would you say to a five-year-old? who had just been scolded by his teacher, for example, and is embarrassed in front of the entire class, a kindergarten class or whatever it may be, you know? And people often say, I don't know what I would say. Like, well, you're five. It just happened to you. Now you're 30, 35, 40, whatever you are. What would you say to a five-year-old who'd just been scolded or to somebody whose dog just ran away or to um, a little kid who just witnessed some violence, you know. It doesn't have to be a huge trauma, either. Or, either I tell this to people as well, and to myself, it could just be something like, like I said about a dog running away. You know, I often say if a four-year-old loses their dog or their kitty for an hour, and the cat comes back, the dog comes back an hour later, in that hour, that four-year-old took in what we'd call a trauma. He took in a wound, even if he had supportive parents around him telling him it's going to be okay, we'll find him, we'll find him. You know, in that moment in time, you're holding on to a feeling that you processed at the age of four that still comes up later on in life and something will happen in life. Uh, Someone will cut you off on the freeway or, you know, it'll be too hot or too cold or, you know, whatever, something will happen and that feeling will get activated. And because we don't want to look back at those unpleasant feelings anymore, we don't want them to be a part of us, we'll do anything we can to distract from them. So we'll dive into work or we'll dive into developing what we call a personality. You know, I'll be the funny guy, you know, or I'll be the the caretaker. How many people out there are, are placators? They like to take care of other people's needs before their own or they... Um, they become uh, the smart one who has all the answers all the time. You know, they, they, they take on a persona. And um, that tries to deflect from the feelings. And then what happens is the feelings are not going to go away just because you deflect from them. In fact, the opposite's going to happen. They're going to build and build and build. Uh, because every time you deflect from them, every time you distract from your feelings, you're telling them to go away. So it's like telling a four-year-old who's crying about his lost dog, shut up. I don't want to deal with you. I don't want to go back there. It's a horrible feeling. You know, um, I don't want to spend time with you. So every time we try to not look at our feelings. Every time we put ourselves on a diet, we're telling those younger feelings, go away, I don't want to deal with you. Now I know people say, but don't you have to go on a diet? Of course, that's what you have to do, but that's not what you have to be. You're going to eventually have to change the way you eat. Of course you are, but you first have to get in touch with what was fueling that to begin with. So we don't want to tell our feelings go away. We want to get in touch with them. We want to take a look at them and be with them a little bit and spend some time so that we can bring down the emotional energy and not tell them anymore, I don't want to be with you. So if I want to devour a box of donuts, I might be feeling really sad somewhere. There might be a six-year-old in there, an eight-year-old in there, a me in there somewhere who's feeling something that is so unbearable that I don't want to have to ever feel that way again. So I ask myself, what am I feeling right now? Where is it in my body? 
right before I eat the box of donuts. You know, the donut could even be in my hand. And I can say, what if I stopped for five seconds and didn't put it in my mouth? What if I stopped for five seconds? What would I feel? What would come up for me? Who would be there? Who is in terms of what part of me? And as I start to feel it, I'm like, okay, I feel real sadness or I feel real anger or I feel real uh, fear or I feel embarrassment or I feel some sort of shame or I feel something. And if I spend time with that, just breathe and be mindful and be in the here and now and be present with that feeling, I allow myself to tolerate that feeling and to even nurture it a little bit. More often than not, because you'd asked me earlier how I did this, I put the donut down. Say, I really don't need this right now, as good as it will taste. And I can choose now, because I can be with feelings now, I can choose when I want to put the donut in my mouth. I can choose if I want to have that powdered sugar all over my lips or if I don't. But before, I was hijacked by that need. And I would make all kinds of excuses and rationalizations saying, oh, it tastes so good. Who cares? I'll diet tomorrow. You know, it's just a couple of donuts. How many calories is that? Or like, oh, I deserve it. I've been working hard all week. You know, or, uh, you know, I just had a, a bad breakup or my, or my best TV show just went off the air. I deserve this. You know, or whatever you'd say to yourself. That's just another part of you trying to convince your mind to not look at the feelings. Don't look at the feelings. Have the donut. There's a good reason for it. You know, you mm-hmm. can have the donut. So that's essentially, um, sort of in a nutshell, how I started to approach it. And uh, it didn't come from me. I'm not going to say this is my philosophy. It came from many philosophies that I've borrowed throughout my training and experience. Uh, some brilliant, brilliant, brilliant minds that I've been trained by and had the, um, you know, the the absolute luxury of working with um, over time. And they nurtured me both personally and professionally. And I sort of wove it all together into a stream of thinking and a stream of uh, sort of a theoretical paradigm for myself and uh, to help others as well. And it's been successful. I mean, it's worked for me. Um, About eight years ago, I did the final 40 pounds and it's been off ever since. And it's not been an issue for me. It's become a non-issue. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, it sounds like you just gave us a ton of things oh, right now. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's it's going to be a while to digest all of this, but yes. um, I really appreciate it. And I feel like, you know, this podcast is going to be about this. It's going to be about understanding more about our feelings, our mind and mindfulness and all the things you just mentioned. And so uh, hopefully, you know, uh, pe- people that are listening, um, tune in. We're going to try to do this every week. Uh, we still don't have the time yet because we're working on a lot of the do- logistics still. Mm-hmm. But um, it, this is definitely something we're going to be doing every week. And, and, and you know, like I, like I said, we're going to talk more about things like this and how we can heal our wounds and how we can move forward in our lives and do the things that we want to do uh, without reacting. More than more like doing it because we want to, not because we're reacting to our past or our wounds from the past or things that have affected us mo- most of it. So any final words? Neil, before we end this podcast? Uh, um, sure. Just I'll briefly say that, um, you know, it also, there's different philosophies that can blend into this. So mm-hmm. that, um, you know, I know you do a lot of work in, in mindfulness and in, um, you know, meditation and whatnot. Yes. And anything that allows the individual to get to a place of self-leadership where your, your core self, you know, which I didn't really bring up, where your mindful self is in the lead. I call him or her the CEO of your internal factory or your internal business. Anything that leads to that is, is fair game. So anything that allows you to come down, whether it's meditation, whether it's you know, uh, mindfulness classes, whatever it is that brings you to that place, there's not one way to get there. So um, I want to make that clear that even though I have a philosophy, you know, the philosophy is not the be-all, end-all. It's just a f- uh, theoretical framework to look at it f- from, and there are many different ways to, to get in there. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's what the point of this podcast is, is to yeah. explore all those different avenues. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I thought that was important to say. Yeah. yeah. I talked a lot. So. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. And we'll see you all, all of you next time uh, on MindFit and this new podcast. And we're going to be in all the platforms, uh, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And eventually we'll have a Facebook page and a YouTube page as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com or you can call us directly at 714-328-4661.